Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much. We are really excited to talk to you today about portals and platforms and how good interfaces make good operability. So my name is Abby Bangzer. You may have heard from me earlier if you were here as I'm one of the co-leads of the working group, uh, the platforms working group here in the CNCF. I'm also a principal engineer at Syntasso, or where we are building Cradix, which is a framework for helping you build internal platforms. Uh, these pictures are showing me trying to get my pup to actually go in the water with me on a canoe, and uh, bringing platform engineering to the final continent when I got to visit Antarctica last year. So come chat with me at our booth about all things travels, pups, and platforms. And hello, everyone. I'm Jorge Lenfiesta. I work at Rudley, which is I'm not biased, but it's the best on-call and alerting solution. And I am also a certified sommelier, so just where you can see me picking up grapes. And I got into uh, road biking this year, which means I have less friends, but I'm cooler. Um, yes. And today we're going to, oh, you can also find me on Rootley's booth uh, during KubeCon. And today we are going to talk about a problem that you've probably seen many times. It takes about four to six weeks on a good month for a developer to actually start coding a solution. Once they already have everything they need to start coding, they still need to go through security, uh, talk with ops, infrastructure, go with legal, check compliance, and get all these people on board on how you should create a new service is not easy. So because we are, well, well you, you are all platform engineers, you know that you can do something better. You can make this process much simpler for people so they don't have to stumble upon the same rocks all the time. So you decide that you are going to create a solution. You're going to set up a portal, then you're going to create a template that's going to abstract away all the complexity of dealing with different uh, stakeholders, and finally, profit. Everybody's going to be so happy. So you got started by setting up a backstage portal. And you stand up backstage. Uh, I, I'm the author of the Introduction to Backstage course, so I, I, I know Backstage is a great tool, uh, but it is not the easiest thing to set up. Uh, but let's say you do it because you're great engineers, and once you get a hold of it, it's a matter of setting it up correctly. You can always check out my course, which was updated uh, recently on the Linux Foundation. And uh, you thought that was difficult, but that was the easy part of your journey. Uh, standing up backstage is just the beginning of getting a solution to abstract, to, to, fi to fix things for app developers. Because now you're going to figure out, you're going to have to deal with the stakeholders on what do we want a new feature to look like in terms of compliance, architecture, infrastructure, uh, local environment provisioning. And all of that is going to be difficult to agree on. So you're going to back on this journey to find the golden path. What is it? That's, that's going to take you some time to figure out. But eventually, you will find the golden template. It's going to be born. Everybody's going to be happy. All your stakeholders are going to like it, which is rare. And then the problem is going to be that nobody's using your beautiful golden template that took you so long to, to build. So that's going to get you into another mode, which is going to be the adoption drive. You're going to start begging developers to use your template. And it's not their fault. They're already busy doing many things, rushing with deadlines and using dozens of tools already. So if you just show up and be like, hey, I, you have to use this new tool, they're going to be like, sure, yeah. So you need to convince them that there's value in it. And uh, thankfully, we have an incredible panel later today on how to drive adoption. There's going to be a few strategies on how to do that. So definitely check it out. I think it's one of the most interesting challenges in platform engineering is building it and then getting people to actually use the platform that you built. And let's say you attended the panel. So now you have a huge success. Everybody using your beautiful template that has everything solved for everyone. So now you use the backstage scaffolder to create this template. And every of your new services uses this template that has automatic compliance, security, testing, local environments, is everything you ever wished for is already encapsulated there. The problem now is that, oh no, there is a new liability that was introduced in a version or discovered in a version of the thing, uh, one of the dependencies listed in your template. So that means that now all of your services are liable to this vulnerability because you built it all with this one template. So this situation is kind of dramatic, but it's not always like that. At the end of the day, 
the code that gets generated by a template is just code, and it's going to get stale. So you need to plan for upgrades. It's always going to be necessary to plan for upgrades in your software, uh, no matter how you build it, either through a platform or manually. But how? How do we build for the future when we use templates? Well, it's important we go back to the start of that story. The goal was to help engineers get moving faster on delivering business value through building software. Now, that, the solution that uh, Jorge just described helped people get started quickly, but it didn't build with the future in mind. In reality, day one is only a single day. Day two, 2,000, and more are many more days of actually supporting things over time, so we have to build with operability in mind. What is operability would be the next question, the next fair question. And often operability is thought about as just BAU, business as usual. And Steve Smith's quote here lends itself to that. It talks about increasing reliability and reducing operational load. But I'm doing Steve Smith a disservice here because his quote actually goes on to also showcase how operability can build for the future as well. It can build in the ability to increase feature development on software. So reality is, is that operability is more than just making the thing that already exists work well. It's about thinking about your past, your present, and your future. And we're going to be talking about how you need to build with all three of those phases in mind from the very beginning. So to do that, we want to dive into operability at a little bit of a lower level, because it's quite a high-level term that people throw around. And we're going to use three other illities or quality attributes that we think are a little bit more descriptive and build together the picture of operability. The first is going to be maintainability. With maintainability, you're kind of looking at the past. Your existing software, what does it look like to support it? The second we're going to look at is usability. This is sort of your present. What does it look like to ha allow for adoption? What does it look like to reduce the toil and the load on the team to support that software? Because it's just easy for people to use. And the last one we're going to be talking about is extensibility. And with extensibility, this is obviously towards the future. How can you build something you couldn't even imagine on day one easily and affordably as you move forward? So let's jump right into maintainability. So maintainability's definition is probably the closest to just what people think operability is. It's that business as usual, keeping the lights on piece of work. It's about taking existing users, existing tools, existing software, and getting it working well. If you're unsure if you're doing work towards maintainability, some of these activities might ring a bell. So maintainable, uh, maintainability type activities often have to do with things that your users will never witness, but make a very big difference on having that software be able to sustain over time securely and scalably. So upgrades, performance optimizations, bug fixes, patches, and those kinds of things. So when we talk about maintainability, we, it's good to know the concept, but let's illustrate it further with a, a specific example of a challenge that you can find uh, in this realm. So a challenge that uh, we can talk about is the one that was introduced earlier in the story, which is that your software is fine, but you need to update uh, the, some database um, uh, patch version because there was a new vulnerability and you need to patch it as soon as possible. Uh, so the task that you need to complete in this case as a platform engineering is to, engineer is to identify who's vulnerable in the first place so you know what is the scope of the, the the, the problem, then to stop new vulnerabilities from happening, and finally, fix the existing uh, vulnerabilities in your ecosystem. And in this talk, we're going to be going through how do we tackle these challenges in a world where you have a portal only, which would be backstage, and a, and a, and a world where you have a full platform operating behind. And to get into that, I will just briefly talk about the backstage architecture from like this Eagle Eye View, which is um, basically you have a UI that is composed of several plugins. Uh, so Backstage is a framework of plugins. Everything is a plugin, and every plugin has a backend component and a front-end component. And the UI is conformed of several UI components. They are all coded in React. And then you have the backend, which is uh, Node. And what you would do is, for example, in the Circle CI plugin, it is connected to its, some proxy that is within uh, running in some backend, and then it connects with some external source. And in the case of the scaffold, there is something similar. You have a UI that the user actually uses uh, on the portal, 
that has a backend that does all the things that uh, ping into external services we needed. Um, so with that context, uh, to tackle the challenge that I described a little bit earlier with a portal, what you would do is to disable first the scaffolder template so it doesn't spread anymore, so your people stop using that template that has this kind of vulnerability built in. Then you can check the catalog. You can use the backstage catalog API to query all the services that were created using a template, and then from there you have identified who's impacted. And finally, oh, well, not finally, but the next step would be to create a PR, where uh, create a scaffolder that opens a PR on the service that is impacted, because backstage is all about ownership and the, giving ownership to the people who build the code and is responsible for it. So instead of being prescriptive and pushing changes into their code bases, the approach in backstage is to have them um, make it easier for them to apply the patch on their code base. So you will create a template that they can self-serve and just use on their own and then have that fix on their code base, uh, based whenever they want to or whenever it's good for them. Uh, the thing is that then you will have to start chasing the teams and be like, hey, we created this template so you can easily upgrade this patch that is critical for you to update. Please do it. And then after some begging, you will have all the teams uh, updated to use your, your, the, the patch, to have apply the patch through the scaffolder template. And finally, you, you also want to update the template so it doesn't have the, the liability that you were trying to get rid of in the first place. Now, I hear that Backstage is all about ownership, and I think it's a really important part of this. But in reality, do your app devs actually care about this patch? Is it affecting their ability to write software? Is it affecting their ability to deliver value through their software? Or are they just wanting to be secure and not have to think about it? So I'm going to challenge this idea a little bit and take a bit of a lightning bolt to that architecture we were just talking about. Right now, all that architecture is done through the UI, and it's done as a one-time create and then just a read kind of interface. And all that logic is sitting in that UI layer and talking directly to your business APIs and your technology APIs behind the scenes. But what would happen if we introduced an API layer in the middle that actually holds that business logic? So this layer will allow you to remove that logic from the UI and allow you to do transformations and updates based on what your business requires. It even also unleashes other interfaces, such as CLI tools and things to be able to call from automation. Now, this isn't actually groundbreaking in any way. I don't get to claim any credit for this, because it's really just the three-tier architecture that is so popular and common in all of software engineering. It's called out as well in the Gartner report around platform engineering that was released, I think, now almost a year ago, where they look at the fact that uh, the platform comes with interfaces, it comes with infrastructure, but it needs that middle fat layer of the business logic, of the tools, of the services. And Daniel Bryant uh, annotated this diagram in a really awesome blog where he calls out those three tiers, and I suggest you check it out. So in a world where we have this three-tier situation, what we can talk about to solve this challenge is what should be visible in the UI to actually configure. Should they be configuring the complete version for the database they might need or something else, or do you just want to expose major version? That's the thing that's going to tell them what, uh, what features the database and tool is providing them. They don't need to worry about the patch and the miner. They just want it to be secure and supported. Your business layer can now have that thought and it can update itself and have ownership over things like security patches so you can roll those out quickly. So what does that look like as a set of steps? Well, the first step looks very similar to the portal. You can query your API or you can use the, the portal catalog. There's no reason to, to throw the portal out uh, to figure out who is vulnerable. You can also turn off the rec more new requests to that API rather than introducing more of these vulnerabilities. But because the change is now behind that API, you have the ability to codify your change and actually test it and own the rollout of it, including techniques like canaries and rollback strategies and everything else, without having to try and just chase people around the office, whether that be in person or virtual, to ask them to do something that is not at the top of their to-do list, of their backlog. And so you can confidently roll out this change because you own, as a platform team, the supportability of that security. So the second quality attribute we want to talk about today is usability. With usability, we're not just talking about, is it nice? What we're talking about is, can people find things that they need? Can they learn it, use it, manage it? Usability is more than just 
is it nice or does it look nice, and it's all these things. It allows for adoption to be a lot, of an, a lot easier process, and it also allows you to reduce your support costs, because if people can onboard easily without talking to you, uh, and they can teach others around them uh, because it's easy to understand, it's a lot lower cost. Some of the activities you might already be doing today, even if you don't think about yourself doing usability, is you might be thinking about who's actually trying to use your software. If you're building a platform, you're probably thinking about the app developers, but the platform is a platform. It has two sides to the market. It has people trying to provide services and people trying to consume them. So it's not just the app devs consuming, it's also those producing. Have you been thinking about them? But aside from just understanding your user base and their need for usability, the things you can do to improve it include things like delight features where you are, aren't actually providing new functionality, but you are smoothing people's journey, making it easier for them to understand, little tool tips to explain stuff, things like that that can be helpful. Uh, and then in addition, you can enable customization, which will allow people to build what they need to on top of your service because it's easily extensible and, and usable. And as Abby was saying, uh, the usability is not about making it pretty. Uh, and it's about enabling more people to provide things through your platform. So let's look at a challenge uh, that we can, that I've seen quite frequently happen in the backstage ecosystem. Uh, it's like, let's say that you already have this popular uh, portal or platform that people are going to, to get what they need for development. So it makes sense that the analytics team also wants to jump on board and provide their services to other app developers or other teams through the, the, the portal that you already have. So that may look as providing them with easier tools so they can adopt the metrics easily. Uh, so let's say you have several teams that build websites. So all these properties will need to keep up to date with what the analytics is putting together. So they can go and grab this uh, from scaffolder template, for example. I'm getting a bit far ahead. Uh, but let's say that there's some tasks to complete uh, in this challenge you have to set up a way in which non-platform teams can contribute to the platform. In this case, so the analytics team can contribute something to the platform. Then you have to make it, you have to enable some way so change can be pushed to exist system specification because the analytics team is probably not, have a, not gonna have the final solution forever. They're likely gonna have to update it, so then they will have to give updates to all of their customers as well, and then we, uh, the platform also needs to be able to provide uh, visualization because we don't want to end up giving developers dozens of tools. Instead, you want to centralize it into a one tool so you, you reduce the cognitive load on developers by saying, oh, I can grab that from the analytics team and also check out the analytic results on the same platform. That's kind of the, the ideal. And in a portal-only experience, uh, what you would do is that you can enable the analytics team to set up a scaffolder template that will open PRs to the people who have properties in which they want uh, metrics installed. So they put together this, this scaffolder, and then it's gonna be readily available on your backstage portal, and then any team that has a website can just click a few, fill in a few forms, and they will have the code ready on their, on their, on their website. And the, the thing is that you, the, the analytics team will have to make it known that this is the option that they have to go for. Uh, that means doing a little bit of adoption drive on their own tools so other developers are aware that this is an option now. And the next step is uh, more complicated because um, you need, the, the analytics team will have to manage somehow the code bases that install their trackers. So they need to find a way to keep them up to date or knowing which one is lagging behind. So it's a, a challenge that doesn't have a, the clearest solution right now using Backstage alone. And uh, finally, you can also create some kind of visualization plugin in Backstage using uh, React and Node to set up a visualization layer that consumes uh, that what, whatever your analytics team is outputting. And then the platform team just needs to have some kind of way so the analytics team can deploy this into their backstage instance, which can look as a, an NPM package or a, could be a monorepo which they put, to, put their code into. Yeah, so the, uh, what this would look like in a platform-driven experience is you can actually enable the analytics team to do things in their way. 
Do they need to learn Node.js? Do they need to learn React.js? Or do they typically work in different languages? If they're data-oriented, it might be Python. If they are more platform-oriented, it might be Golang. Whatever it is, can we build the ability for people to actually provide services in their languages and in their tools. So similar to a microservice world, if you have that API that is, allows people to discover it, who cares what it's written underneath by? And so we're enabling people to create those APIs for themselves in their own way. In addition, by having all these be APIs behind the scenes, we can have this API actually get pulled in by the service creator that we originally talked about in that story. So don't need to ask someone to go add analytics for them. This platform can have awareness and ownership over that service for its entire lifetime, and the analytics team can push out that ability to have better logs, better tracing, better observability, and better data to the services as they stand. Uh, finally, when we're talking about visualization, I agree with Jorge, it's great to have that single pane, that single accessibility. But when you're doing everything at that top layer, you have to build it yourself. By actually building one layer down, you can use whatever tool you want to visualize. It could be Kibana and Grafana or any other tool. And then just use one of the readily available community plugins to pull those visualizations in rather than building something unique and uh, specific. So going to step into the third quality attribute, which is extensibility. With extensibility, we're looking toward the future, but I think that Gregor Hope's quote here is the key. It's not just how fast can your team churn out new features. If you're not building a platform that people are doing surprising things on top of, you're building ops. And I will quote Lou here, who isn't here from Gitpod, but he said that he's worried platform engineering is becoming ops in a trench coat. And if all that you do is have a single team provide things to people, and, and that single team is a bottleneck, that's the risk. Your platform should have a marketplace on top of it. And so with extensibility, it's not about new features for the, uh, that the team can pump out and provide services. It's about how to build that ability for people to build services on top of their platform. How do they build that marketplace capability? How do they enable new interaction modes? So not just a portal, as amazing as it is. What about a CLI? What about a custom CLI that a team wants to own because it's very bespoke to them? Can people build new inter interaction models for you? And of course, workflows, being able to build uh, out of the composition parts of your platform rather than being handed one big black box. That's our problem. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, let's look at a very interesting challenge in the extensibility, and it's about just pushing the boundaries of, to me, at least for me, this is like an example that really made me think. Uh, it was thanks to Abby that has a uh, great sight on the future. And it's, let's say, that the finance team also wants to participate somehow in the platform because they have requirements, and especially now with the, the economics that we, they are, so they want to have some, Just watch out. some more control over the, 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 how the organization works. So we need, as, plat as a platform team, to enable them to have something to say in the platform. So the task would be to enable the finance team to own and change their own requirements, because they are going to change, but they have to sometimes have an impact in the platform, and then keep running checks on whether this is happening or it's not happening. Uh, in the portal and experience, this is not possible. We cannot provide autonomy to the finance team in any way, really. But there are some other alternatives, which would be giving developers knowledge on how they are consuming resources so they can gamify the experience and make better choices on how to develop our, their architectures and the infrastructure that they consume. Uh, because given that they are aware of the nature of engineering that they have, they will likely try to make it better once they know the cost of their operation. And that means that the, the team, the finance team, will still have to create a process of reviewing budgets and sitting down with 12 people at the end of each quarter and the usual stuff. But we're platform engineers. We want to automate some of this stuff. What happens if we put a platform behind that? What happens if we look at this large feedback loop that involves having to talk to that one bottleneck team, and we change it to making that team build a process that allows the, the owners, the subject matter experts, to actually own the process? This isn't a magic bullet. The platform team still has to do energy here to build the feature. But their feature is not about cost checking. Their feature is about enabling the finance team to be a producer of a service within their platform. 
allowing them to use their interfaces. So maybe Excel to drive the understanding of how to validate those uh, behaviors. And it's leaning on what already exists in the platform, which is a way to hook into when people create, update, or just regularly want to check the status of their services. So we're not rebuilding all of that for everything. So uh, yeah, this is all about giving them the power. Now, we've talked about portals and platforms today, and portals have been a great look at what you can focus on user interactions. And what we've introduced by bringing in platforms behind that portal is making sure we're thinking not just about a single instance of something, but an entire fleet. How do you manage your entire organization? And you might think of this as a little bit of a versus situation, but it's not. Portals and platforms actually collaborate so well together because they both cherish the same things. Have a contract, have an API, have discoverability, enable that interoperability between the two. They are collaborative in, in nature. So in conclusion, um, portals and platforms are technical solutions, um, but neither of them can support alone the business needs or control business outcomes that your organization needs. Therefore, you must focus on a complete and operable solution that will deliver usability, extensibility, and maintainability. Thank you so much, and please do review this talk and all the talks you visit today at Platform Engineering Day. It really helps uh, the committee get the right talks on the stage for the next one. So thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you.